So if you all can see this, um, because since we're here in this wonderful uh, seminar celebrating all the achievements of our students and postdocs, I thought I'd just take two minutes to highlight um, um, all the other people that have been working with me or, were, or are currently working with me you know, who don't get a chance to talk today. So we are a group that, that studies electronic excitations in various circumstances using mostly TDDFT. So uh, there is uh, Eddie Pluhar who uh, actually just finished his PhD uh, just recently. Matt Anderson was supposed to do the introduction but he is up to his neck and finishing his thesis. He is a bit stressed out. So I'll do it instead. Jiu Yu just finished his postdoc and now went on to uh, work in Hamburg at the Max Planck. And I will talk later about Jared. So let me just tell you in just a few seconds what each of these guys um, has been doing. So Eddie did his PhD on uh, spin DFT for non-collinear systems. So what he was doing. Um, he worked on model systems and looked at things such as uh, Hubbard type models, such as this foresight Hubbard system with two electrons. So the idea was to look at exchange correlation torques and compare various approximations uh, in the ground state in the dynamical regime. So for instance, he also looked at things uh, like Hubbard trimer looking at the spin dynamics close to the linear to non-collinear phase transition and how this affects how the exchange correlation torques play a role there. Uh, Matt is uh, currently finishing up his, his thesis, as I said. So he looks at spin waves and graphene. So graphene is, of course, an important system. So we dope it, we split the bands, and we look at collective excitations such as plasmons and spin waves and Matt's particular problem was to uh, look at obviously many body effects and since Dirac fermions are not an electron gas you need different types of functionals so he is using the STLS and Slater method to study spin waves. Uh, Jiu Yu, uh, he was a postdoc with me for two years and uh, he has been working on TDDFT for excitons so in insulators and semiconductors so he did two major things. So one major thing was to develop a hybrid functional that uh, works specifically for excitonic effects. It's a dielectrically screened hybrid functional and that works pretty well compared to the beta Zalpeter equation. And more recently, we also did excitonic effects in real time. So we solved or UU solved the time dependent cone sham equation with a very special exchange correlation functional that is based on so-called long range corrected functionals. And we can now describe excitonic effects in real time uh, for various types of, of materials. So that then brings me to uh, the work that Jared has done and that he will talk about. So Jared is a PhD student in uh, his third year and so he's been with me for over two years now. And his first project, that's what he's going to be presenting, is also in the context, well, his, his PhD work is in, in, on the topic of excitons. And uh, the project that he's going to present is about a way of visualizing excitons, the exciton wave function. And specific, specifically, he, he has found a way to do this in real time. So, to see how excitons move, how they form, how they move, and how they also dissociate. And um, right now, he is um, moving on to other topics on the, on, on the subject of excitons, such as low dimensional systems. So he's in the middle of all of that. So um, without further ado, I will now stop and shut up and let Jared present his work. So thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so, um, so uh, as uh, previously discussed, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, time resolved exciton wave functions that we got from using TDDFT. Um, and so, the, uh, the obvious first uh, question there 
uh, is, well, what are excitons? Uh, and while many people here are probably familiar as a quick overview, uh, when an excitation uh, or a light wave comes into a system, uh, it can promote a valence band electron up to the conduction band, leaving behind a hole, uh, which the electron is electrically attracted to. Uh, and this quasi-particle is what we call an exciton. Uh, these typically appear uh, near where the bands are closest together. Um, and they can range in uh, size in real space to potentially up to over multiple unit cells, largely related to how much screening is happening. Um, but we see them experimentally mostly uh, in the spectra like this, where they show up as these large peaks uh, prior to the band gap energy. Um, <clears throat> and so when looking at these excitons and what their wave functions look like uh, and how to describe them, the, this has been done before, of course. Um, and here are some examples of like a, a 2D contour plot, um, a heat map, or uh, even like a 1D uh, cut through uh, of the wave functions. And these are obviously very nice, uh, but there are two uh, kind of issues that we are hoping to uh, get around with what we're doing. And the first is uh, these are obviously static images, which means you can't look at things like dynamics uh, very well, formation, dissociation, that kind of thing. Uh, and also these were obtained using uh, the GW beta sulpater equation, uh, which is uh, somewhat computationally expensive to do. So we wanted to uh, use TDDFT uh, in order to uh, bump up that efficiency as well. Uh, so to lay some groundwork, <clears throat> Uh, we're looking at uh, what's called the TDM or transition density matrix, uh, which is essentially a mapping from the ground state uh, to an excited state via the one body density matrix operator. Uh, and this quantity is what's going to uh, come out as the, the exciton wave function. And so in practice, there are really two ways to solve this. Uh, the first is a linear response method uh, using something such as the Cassida equation uh, shown here, uh, defined in terms of these two uh, matrices that make up well, parts of this matrix. Uh, and you can see this depends on the, uh, the uh, orbitals as well as uh, the uh, kind of Hartree and exchange correlation terms. Uh, and when you solve this, uh, you can calculate something called the trans transition density, which is, uh, as the name implies, the density of transitions from some uh, occupied uh, unexcited state to an unoccupied, unoccupied uh, excited state. Uh, and by extension, uh, this can be taken where uh, the only difference between this and the previous expression is the uh, insertion of these primes on two of these R's uh, to define uh, what we call the cone sham uh, TDM. And something that's important to note, as, uh, as I kind of stated, is that uh, when this prime goes away and R equals R prime, these are uh, the, in principle, exact transition densities. Um, However, the off-diagonal elements where R and R prime are not the same uh, are not in principle exact. Um, so, but uh, the alternative approach uh, and the one that we wanted to look at with this work is a um, time-dependent uh, or real-time uh, way to look at this. So if we take a weakly perturbed system uh, where we assume that the system is uh, in its ground state plus a small deviation, uh, we can then define the time-dependent transition density matrix uh, picture here. And then similarly to um, in the previous method, uh, we can come up with this uh, cone sham time dependent TDM uh, that essentially depends on the difference between uh, products of orbitals. Uh, so now in order to uh, put this into practice, we need some kind of system to do our test calculations in. Uh, so we have a 1D model solid uh, where we take a very simple periodic cosine potential um, and splitting that into unit cells. We take four electrons per unit cell. Um, and from this, we can calculate the ground state density uh, that has this shape per unit cell, uh, which gives us this band structure. And uh, once again, the, um, uh, the excitons we want to look at uh, in this area here near the, the band edge. Um, however, we still need uh, a couple more things. The first of which is a, an exchange correlation potential uh, in order to actually produce the excitons. And that comes in here uh, in the form of this exchange correlation kernel. Uh, for which here we choose the long range corrected kernel, which in 3D has, has this form and in 1D has this form. We added a softening parameter uh, as to make it not blow up. And since we're doing our calculations in reciprocal space, uh, we do a Fourier transform and get something like this that depends on these modified Bessel functions. And then the last piece of the puzzle before we can uh, really see what we're getting here uh, is something to, to start the system moving. Otherwise, it'll just uh, sit there. And 
One uh, way to do that, and the most simple, and the first I'll talk about, is this periodic sawtooth scalar potential that we switch on and then quickly switch off. That essentially introduces a bias across the unit cell uh, to offset the electrons so they start oscillating and moving. Uh, and we can get away with this in 1D uh, because of the way that the uh, that it couples to uh, the system, but in 2 or 3D, we would need a vector potential. Uh, all right. So finally, with all that laid out, uh, let's see something uh, actually interesting. Uh, so here are the, uh, the main results we got. And there's a lot going on. So let me try to uh, break this down in the, uh, the simplest way possible. So looking first at this lower left um, uh, thing here, we're looking at the dipole moment uh, versus time. And you'll see there's this initial drop uh, as we uh, put in that offset that quickly dies off. And you see also these uh, transients dying off in the, the wave function. Um, from this, you can also very well see that the, the system very quickly uh, goes into regular oscillations, uh, which you see here in the, the wave functions. So this upper left graph is a cut through the exciton wave function where we've taken and fixed the hole to be specifically at position zero. Uh, and so we're essentially looking at the distribution of the electron around it. Um, and you'll see the static green line here is actually the um, exciton wave function calculated via the linear response method. Uh, so our method is showing um, very good agreement uh, in shape, and uh, it's acting almost like a, an average of the time-dependent wave function. And then on the right, you'll see the full wave function, where the whole uh, position is on the vertical axis, and the electron position is on the um, horizontal axis. You see a strong collection of uh, the exciton wave function along the uh, x equals x prime uh, diagonal there, uh, because, of course, the electron and the whole want to be close together when possible. Uh, so now I want to go ahead and uh, talk about just a few more ways we can um, we can look at this system, uh, a few more knobs we can turn. Um, <clears throat> one of which, uh, going back away from the uh, the time dependent wave functions for just a moment, uh, is we can mess around with the strength of the um, exchange and correlation uh, kernel, uh, this alpha, uh, and we see that when we do that, the exciton peak uh, shown here, uh, going from you know, zero to one to two to three to four. Uh, gets farther back and uh, much stronger. And uh, looking at a more dense collection of uh, these points, you can see the strength of the uh, exciton actually uh, increases exponentially uh, with the uh, with the strength of the exchange correlation kernel. <clears throat> and additionally, we can look at systems uh, like um, like this. So this over here is kind of the same system we're already looking at. Uh, you can look at the exciton wave function at different uh, hole positions, which is, of course, going to change the shape. Uh, but another thing we can do is look at solids with defects. Uh, so uh, something like this, where the, uh, the density is a bit uh, different from the other unit cells in some areas, and uh, look at things like uh, charge transfer excitations. Uh, and this isn't something we have, uh, uh, we have very nice um, uh, these are nice animations for, but uh, is another thing that uh, we've done with linear response and, uh, and something you could do. Other knobs to turn in the uh, actual time dependent department, though, um, <clears throat> is uh, one is how you excite the system initially. Uh, so instead of using this um, scalar potential uh, to offset the electrons, what we can do instead is use a short pulse. Um, and we can uh, vary the frequency of this pulse to see what happens. So here we've uh, got an above, on, and below resonance pulse, where in this case, resonance, uh, the resonance frequency corresponding to the binding energy of the exciton. Uh, and you see that uh, with both the below and above resonance uh, pulses, uh, while this uh, exciton quickly forms, it also just as quickly dies away as the, the pulse goes away. Um, however, if we excite the system on resonance or just at, at right about the uh, exciton binding energy, you'll see that the wave function forms. And then even as the pulse dies away, uh, the exciton does not. Um, and in our simulations, actually, the exciton will have an infinite lifetime because we haven't uh, added any kind of decay mechanism. Um, uh, but instead of messing with the frequency of this uh, pulse, another way to, uh, to look at it uh, is by messing with the, the strength of the pulse. Um, <clears throat> And you'll see that uh, by these graphs over here on the left, uh, as we increase the strength of this, uh, the electric field uh, corresponding to this pulse, uh, the wave function uh, gets a little bit distorted uh, as we go up a little bit, but the same general shape is happening. Uh, and this 
change uh, from what we were seeing initially is uh, the onset of nonlinear effects from more uh, higher bands coming into play. Uh, but by the time the uh, field strength gets up even just to one, the, the shape has changed uh, dramatically. And uh, you can see kind of how this is happening in the, uh, with the population of the upper bands uh, here, where you can see it's growing uh, like exponentially in, um, in population. Um, and uh, that after you get to uh, about one or so uh, with the electric field strength, the uh, thing becomes totally nonlinear um, and has this uh, very different uh, type of effect. However, in this, uh, in this regime, the, uh, we still only have about two and a half uh, of the uh, percent of the electrons excited. Uh, so this is still pretty well within the, uh, the linear regime. Um, and to complement these graphs from the previous page, uh, we've got a couple of animations that might work. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that uh, at a fairly low um, electric field strength, uh, the exciton forms pretty much instantly uh, and keeps its same form. A few wiggles dying out uh, from the uh, initial pulse uh, leaving, but overall keeping roughly the same form. And as we increase the field strength uh, by 10 orders of magnitude, or by one order of magnitude, sorry, uh, the same thing kind of happens. And though uh, the shape is roughly the same, these are all scaled. Uh, so this is uh, 10 times as tall. And uh, the same is going to be true here at e equals 1. And where we saw those nonlinear effects coming in earlier, we can now see uh, this is causing these um, uh, kind of oscillations back and forth uh, of the wave function. And though it still is keeping the same general shape, um, is uh, obviously different than these. And by the time we get uh, all the way up to this uh, uh, very large uh, electric field, no longer is the shape even really reminiscent uh, of the exciton wave function and uh, is we're very clearly outside the, uh, the linear regime at this point. So in the last little uh, example I wanted to, to, wanted to discuss uh, a bit before I'll uh, give some conclusions and, uh, and open the floor for questions. Uh, is this um, calculation we've done where now, in addition to this exciting pulse uh, coming in with uh, different field strengths, we've also introduced a static electric field uh, across the across the wave function or the um, unit cell, um, <clears throat> and we've also uh, played with the strength of this electric field. So, uh, just like in the in the previous um, examples, you see that uh, with the as the exciting pulse increases in strength, uh, so too does the, uh, the exciton. Um, and on these graphs, the, the vertical axis is uh, the time. And you see that it's, uh, the wave function is growing in time. And that's due to this uh, Zener tunneling effect where uh, because of the bias introduced by the electric field, um, more electrons are able to uh, essentially tunnel into the, uh, the conduction band and, uh, and form more excitons. And so the exciton population grows. Um, however, uh, you also see that as the static electri uh, electric field increases in strength, uh, we also see kind of this smearing out of the wave function uh, to one side. Um, and this is essentially the electric field uh, attracting the two different ch differently charged uh, carriers in different directions, trying to pull the excitons apart. So we actually have uh, kind of both a uh, exciton population increasing uh, effect, as well as a, an exciton dissociation effect happening uh, at the same time. Right. <clears throat> so uh, to sum up, um, we've looked at excitonic effects in solids uh, and shown that in addition to this linear response uh, method, we can also uh, visualize them well with this time propagation method. And we've done these proof of concept uh, calculations with our 1D model solid. Um, and we visualize them in a number of ways. Uh, so in the future, when we uh, are able to return to this project, we'd like to do similar things with these uh, exciton movies uh, in 3D, uh, look at other effects, and uh, perhaps uh, even exciton relaxation. Uh, right.